Now here is one that makes a lot of sense to people, kind of. It's called affordances. This refers to an attribute of an object that allows people to know how to use it. Something as simple as you have a mouse button. What do you do to a mouse button? You click it. That's great affordance. All right, so if you see buttons on, your, on a phone, what do you do with the buttons? You click the buttons. All right, it has a lot of affordance. So you look at it, you automatically know what to do with it. Now I want you to turn around and look at the uh, doors back there. How do you open the doors? Yeah, you, you, you take that lever and you turn it. Levers have great affordance. Did someone have to tell you to do, how to do that after you were two? No, in fact, we do it automatically. We automatically know what to do based on how the product is designed. Now, if you want to see some really, really interesting examples and a really good book, actually, that talks about this, there's a book by Norman that he wrote in 1988 called The Design of Everyday Objects. You will see things that he talks about in that book that we don't notice every day. So things such as he talks about chairs. All right, so. You see a chair, what do you do? You sit down. It looks like you're supposed to sit down, right? It's the right height, right? It's nice and curved, it has a back to it. A chair has great affordance. Now, affordance actually has been more popularized as we've gone into the digital era because we've taken the physical world and affordance in the physical world and we've moved a lot of these things to the digital world, such as buttons. We make buttons in the digital world look like real world buttons, perfectly natural to us. Now, that wasn't always initially the case, but people found that it's a lot easier for us to automatically know what to do if you put an image of a button on the screen and especially if it provides the appropriate feedback. Now, affordance is really important when it comes to icons. You guys know what icons are, right? So, when you look at icons, I think my examples are on the next page. So if you, no, they're there. So if you look at some icons, let's take a look at this. What's that? A trash can. What do you think you do with it? You put stuff in it that you don't want. Do you think this has great affordance? Yeah, I think it does. All right. What about that? It kind of looks like a washing machine or a dishwasher. I actually don't remember what it is. What do you think of the affordance of this thing? Not so much. How about this one? A yellow square. No? You don't know what the yellow square does? SpongeBob. Well, yeah. So, yeah, not, not so good affordance, right? All right, what about our scroll bars? Those actually do have pretty good affordance once you learn what it is. Typically what you find people who aren't familiar with it, a little harder to do this research these days, but back then when scroll bars were invented, they actually found that people learned what scroll bars are and how they work pretty quickly. They had really good affordance. Now these days, why do you think it's more difficult for us to do research on things like the affordance of, true affordance of scroll bars? Because it's everywhere. Right? My two-year-old knows what a scroll bar is. In fact, my older daughter she got her first Mac when she was 18 months old. Stole it from me. It's supposed to be my Mac. 
And she learned how to get on the internet and use scroll bars in like five minutes. Then we turned the internet off. So these days where our kids are being raised with technology, it's part of their life. So experience does make a difference when it comes to affordance. All right, so this one is one of my favorites. What's that? Rewind or skip back. Usually about half the class knows what that is. Previous chapter, I, ha I forget half the time what it is. So this, for example, is a great example of something that can have good affordance if you're used to using it. What that affordance is will depend on what you're used to using. So if you're used to, to an ebook reader, that may be going back a chapter. If you're used to a VCR, it can be rewind. You know, if you're used to a DVR, it may be going back to the last, I can't remember what they call it, the, whatever point they have. I'm sorry? The, does anyone remember what that's called? I don't remember. Right. The last, you know how they break it up in like an hour, an hour long show, they'll break it up into 15 minutes. It may take you back to the previous 15 minutes. Scene, yeah, maybe the last, go to the last scene. So this, some would argue has great affordance, with others would argue maybe not so great affordance. But it really illustrates how experience can make a difference. So in looking at affordance, particularly when it comes to digital design, I think you'd be surprised to hear that there are actually people who have tried to argue that affordance doesn't really matter in interaction design because it's not real. So they'll say that interfaces are virtual and do not have affordances like physical objects. So do we really want to worry about it? Norman, for example, even argues that it doesn't make sense to talk about interfaces in terms of real affordances. Now that surprises people sometimes considering who Norman is. But what he actually argues is that instead we need to think a little bit differently about the digital world if we want to design great products. We want to really conceptualize interfaces as perceived affordances. Why do you think that distinction is important? Remember when we talked about how we perceive things a couple of lectures ago? Do we perceive things as they actually are? No. We need to think about how we as humans perceive things. Now, this opens up a much wider world in the design world for coming up with new and innovative ideas, including making things that have more affordance. Now, how many of you have a smartphone or tablet with you? Okay, I want you to pick it up really quick. All right, do you have pictures in there? Okay, I want you to go to your pictures. Now I want you to take a look at your favorite pictures. Scroll through and take a look at your favorite pictures. You guys done? How easy was that? Very easy. How many of you had to read directions or take lessons on how to scroll through pictures on your tablet or smartphone? Yeah, not so much. That's an example of what Norman is talking about. Our affordances in the digital world aren't just something like a chair. They're also how do we interact in general? How do we scroll through? There is an entire area of research that just looks at gestures. Because what you just did was you used gestures. What gestures do we find have the most affordance? So our idea of affordance in digital products is actually expanding. Now, there are still those holdouts that want to have the argument that you don't really want to talk about those things in affordance. That's a whole other thing. Feel free to go do a search on the internet. I'm going to put in my personal bias. That, that really is part of affordance. 
We already talked about some of the obvious things with physical affordance. One of the things I like about this room is then I don't have to show you this picture. I have you turn around and look at a real world door. Now, how many of you have walked up to doors that have levers? And you pull, you turn and pull, and it doesn't open. And then what happens? You see a little sign that says push. Like, wait a minute. How much affordance did that have? Yeah, not so much. If we want to push the door, what makes, makes that door have more affordance? Push. Yeah, you either have one of those bars that you push, or you have a plate, or you have something where you're just going to walk through and push. And what happens for, with most of us? We don't think about it. Of course, that's not as good as the ones that automatically open when we step on them, right? And we don't have to think about it at all. 